I'm Maura Dickler, and I'm a breast cancer medical oncologist and global head of breast and gynecologic cancers at Roche Genentech. And I'm here today with Peter Fashing, who is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology and translational medicine at the University of Hospital of Erlinger. So welcome, Peter, and thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. You know, we really have, we're very aligned in terms of our views of innovation and drug development, except we come from slightly different angles, me from pharma and really you from the clinic and, and academia. What would you say are the greatest breakthroughs, let's say, in the past decade? I think in the last decades, we capitalized on the knowledge we have from unraveling the genome and understanding the cellular pathways and the interaction of the microenvironment and the tumor, and quite some drugs have been uh, implemented, you know, based on that knowledge. And then now, more recently, we moved to new drugs, we moved to new developments. So it has been a very exciting last 10 years, to be honest. Yeah, I agree. And really, from moving from the clinic to the pharmaceutical industry, it's really been an incredible time for me, too, to see how drugs have changed over time and how we're really iterating on previous advances. And despite the incredible progress, there really remains unmet need. What would you say are the major areas of unmet need that we really need to focus on? I think it depends on the perspective. If you look at it on a broad scale, the answer to your question is very easy. There's still too many women dying of cancer, mm -hmm. specifically of breast cancer, and the effects that all the treatments have on an epidemiological scale are very small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what's more important for the patients that are treated this year and next year is to have treatments that maintain a good quality of life, that don't have many side effects, but still have an improvement of tumor control and overall survival. So there's two different aspects of that. Right. And the medical need from that perspective is very easy to define. We're not good enough yet to save patients dying from cancer. And on a smaller scale, we have to make the treatments less toxic and having a much, much less effect on quality of life. Yeah, actually, I, I couldn't agree more. And really, you're right. Patients really want to live longer, right? And if they're going to accept these treatments that give them side effects and impact their quality of life, they do want meaningful benefits. And sometimes progression-free survival does not necessarily mean as much to them as overall survival. I would say with the recent advances also, there are mechanisms of resistance when the tumor learns to regrow that we don't understand well. And I think it's important to go from the bench to the bedside and back to, to better understand how we can improve upon the next generation of drugs. I think it's amazing what the scientific community has done as a mm -hmm. whole, mm -hmm. what you just said, from the bench to the bedside and back, yeah. and the pace of what we're experiencing right now with new drugs, what you said, is amazing at yeah. the moment. But we also have to t keep in mind that the therapy management for each new drug has to be considered in a clinic, in a practice, and that's also a big aspect for a medical mm -hmm. need to make these therapies uh, practical. Right. They have to be implemented in a way that it's easy for both patients and doctors. And right. That's another aspect that I think is important. So, and although there remains unmet need, there's so many advances. What are some of the new modalities that interest and excite you most? On top of improving current therapies, of course, there's new substance classes, new platforms that pretty much changed how we approach the treatment as the immunocology drugs, is the antibody drug conjugates. And then we have the radioligands now, which are already implemented in prostate cancer. Now radiation is included into the therapy on a molecular basis. And then we have the cellular therapies that don't play a big role in breast cancer yet. Mm -hmm. And on top of that now, uh, vaccination studies are around the corner as well. So I'm very curious how that pans out. So there's lots of new platforms that are very efficacious. Right. No, it really is an exciting time. And I also think that the chemists have really advanced the science and that we're able to tweak these drugs and, and platforms to really improve selectivity and specificity while dialing out some of the off-target effects that impact toxicity so that our therapeutic index is also getting much better. Couldn't agree more. I would love to include these people, the chemists, a little bit more into the scientific community mm. because as a doctor I don't have contact to these people mm -hmm. that much yet. Right. Maybe we can learn a little bit more from these people that are the new partners. Right, right, right. And so for, for pharma and biotech to work closer with academia, that would be really great. 
So we've talked a little bit about some of the scientific advances and the improvement in precision medicine, but really what's your vision for the patient of the future? Well, first, I think we, which means academia and the industry, has done a beautiful job over the last 10, 15 years to try and develop predictive markers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we've been successful, sometimes we've not been successful. So my hope is to get a little bit better at that, get a little bit more skills mm -hmm. in finding predictive markers and defining patient populations. But then bringing it back to the patients in the clinics, many patients still don't fit the criteria of the clinical trials that we're conducting. There's comorbidities, there's age restrictions, and there's always this special situation that doesn't really fit into the clinical trial setting. So maybe real-world data might help us to integrate a little bit more of variables that describe the human being as an individual and to make decisions based on more parameters. And maybe there in the future with the digital tools, you have a little bit more access to a little bit more descriptive variables of a human being. Right. Well, I, I agree. And actually, there haven't only been advances in drug development, but also these digital tools and artificial intelligence that I think ultimately will make the collection of real world data more meaningful and more effective. And so how can we do better at really bringing new innovations to patients? How can we make our drug development process more patient centric? Well, first, listen to the patients. Listen to what is their needs. Uh -huh. And the first one, you know, and that's most probably not what you mean is they don't want to die. So let's stay ambitious. That's important. But then also listen to the patients, what's their life situation. And there's sometimes I'm not sure that we have the right measurement tools yet. Mm. Patient reported outcomes are very important. Measuring quality of life is very important. But sometimes I have the feeling these instruments could be still be improved for us to be better informed how to get an idea about what the patients actually want. Right? Right, thank you.